the average Australian garage is 3.4 metres by 5.8 metres, which sounds great and big, except for when you have to share it with the car, the boat, the kids, and anything else you can put in there. How are you supposed to get anything done? I think we're on. I think we're on. Greetings, tiny workshoppers. Welcome to the tiny workshop. I'm John Madden. I'm Patrick. It's flat left season. Yeah. It's nice to have you back this week. Thank you very much. My rash is fine. Thank you very much. We'll talk about that later. Um, first one of the season. So anyway, here we are. Patrick, um, but before we go any further, remember to subscribe to our channel and ring the little bell so you don't miss any updates from the tiny workshop. What are we doing tonight, Patrick? So, if you guys have been watching, which I assume most of you have, we're making a step stool for mm-hmm. kids. Mm-hmm. Last week we went through a bunch of joinery, uh, including mainly the dowel and the wedge join. During the break, I glued one side of this up. Later tonight, we're gluing the other side up, live. Live glue up. Live my, glue up. My favourite thing. Now, we've cheated a bit by gluing up half of it because... We were concerned that, A, my heart would stop and you'd panic and run out the door because it's, it, we're going to have to get so much done And you don't, you don't need to see the entire glue up. You, we'll yeah. show you enough stress. But yeah. what we're going to show you tonight is we're going to get stuck into making these bridle joints. Yeah. Now, we're going to do those main cuts on the bandsaw. Yeah. Yeah, after, in a little bit of in the centre of this thing, after we've done some bandsawing, John will demonstrate all of the marking out on a tiny tip. Yeah, we're doing a tiny tip on how to mark out a joint like this, um, and then after that break, we're going to finish up our joints and we're going to glue up the other half of this, all for Jacko Jackson. Jacko, out, hopefully you're out there. Um, so stick around and see the show. It should be quite amusing. So I think you better hook into this. Yeah, absolutely. Too. Okay, so what we're trying to demonstrate is how to make one of these. Now, we're going to cut the waist out with the bandsaw, but we're not going to be right on that line that John has marked. We're going to be a little bit off it yeah. because I, I, I actually tried doing a cut right to the line just as an experiment. Bandsaws are just not reliable enough. They're not yeah. designed for that. And we're only allowed to have a bandsaw, so we have to, we can't, we're not allowed to use the table saw, which would be nice. So we're going to have to finish up those spaces of that joint using chisels. So uh, One thing I decided is I yeah. wanted the band saw, the blade, to actually be able to cut at that angle. Mm. So by placing our timber on a wedge, which is 15 degrees, it's, it matches, it's the complementary angle to what we're trying to make here. The vertical bound saw will cut to the back of that mortise and to the sides of those cheeks mm. in exactly the right way. Mm. Now, you could do this in a number of ways. You could set up the band saw fence so that it's just inside that line. You could run that cut, then you could move the fence and do the second cut. Mm. What I've decided to do is use a series of shims mm. so that I don't have to move the fence at all. Yeah. It's one fence set up. And I'm going to move over to the bandsaw and I'll do this in a process and I'll talk through while I do it. Man, this looks really interesting. You've got a lot of stuff going I on do. there. I do. Let's see how we go. Yeah, look, you better roll our sleeves up. Okay, so, first of all, let me just figure out which one I want to start with. I'm going to, I'm going to be cutting what I'm calling the tenon first. So I'm going to be cutting the waist of the that tenon. tenon. But it's actually a tenon. Yes, yes, absolutely. But it's just on a slight angle. So normally a mortise and tenon joint or a bridle joint will have a square face. But what is normal? Define normal, I'm not sure. But this one's slightly angled, so it adds a level of complication, hence why we're going through this whole process. Now, my first cut, I've actually just put a tiny bit of blue tape on this workpiece so it stays on this wedge. Uh, my first cut is hard up against the fence and that's going to be that side. Then I'm going to put this 19mm uh, piece in there and that'll cut the second cut. If you have a nice close up on this Shelton, I might, might get cutting. Good, Good isn't it? Yeah. Then I put the 19mm in and because, I mean, this is because I've, I've set this all up to do exactly this. There's 
both sides of the tenon cut, and that's what John will be working on. Sure. Now, I'm going to move on to the mortise. I'm just going to tape that to the wedge as well. What's, what's really nice about this cup that uh, Patrick's made is that you've only got about a mil of waste there on either side of those lines. So when we pair, the, pair that timber off with the, with the chisel, we're only removing a mil. Yeah. If you've got two, three mil, then you get so tear out there. and other nightmares will emerge very quickly. A real life nightmare in fact. So, yeah. Okay. Now I'm about to cut the mortise. Now I've had to put in a 3 mil packer and what that does is means that the blade is not cutting where it was but 3 mils over which is on about 1.5 mil on the opposite side of the line. Oh, okay. So that gives me that, that clearance. You're that not just a about. pretty face though, you know. And then I use another packer to do the other side. <laughs> Now I can put my 12 mil in. Go Sherwood. Yeah. All right. Look, so obviously if, you, if you're doing a lot, then having a system like that with those packers makes really short work of making sure you're always on that line without having to move the fence a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's really neat, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to clean up this one because it's the easy one. I'll do the shoulder. You're going to have to knock out that block. So yep. the work I've got to do is relatively straightforward. Um, I'm just going to use a Japanese saw to take these two blocks out Check out these new saws that I've got in store. I really like that handle. I know. It's, it, I didn't know what to think of them, so I really started using them. They've got a lovely Japanese pattern to them, and I don't know, it's got a really nice stiffness about it. Anyway, new in store, plenty of stock. So I just need to pick up that. Not, again, not too far off that line. <laughs> And these saws cut such lovely fine lines. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's just so much finer than, than uh, like a standard. Oh, I'm not a fan of, um, in, you're sort of, yeah. well, I don't, I don't have a particular hatred for them or anything, but give me a Japanese saw any day of the week. A lot of, uh, you see a lot of people trying to do, like, use Australian hardwoods and use a, a European style handsaw. Yeah. And uh, it's, okay. not, it's not clever. No. While John does the other side of that, the way I'm going to remove this mortise waste, there's a couple of ways to do it. If this wasn't angled, you could remove a fair bit of that using the bandsaw. What I'm going to do is a technique where I come in with my chisel and come down from the top and break a chip off and then break, go in again, down from the top, break another chip off. I'll set this up here and... I'll get stuck into that. Okay. And I'll set myself up here too as well. So. Now, one thing you need to be considerate of is you don't want to blow out the back side of this. I'm or use... damage the bench. Yes. So you've got to remember, I'm not cutting right on the line. I'll do that once I've removed a bunch of waste. What I'm doing now is just waste removal. <coughs> Go in like that. Ooh. Hey. Take a chunk out. Now this is not great for if your chisels are like you will blunt your chisel doing this. But aren't chisels in that's what designed, they're designed to for. be blunted, so to speak, and then sharpened. You just but if you if you do find your chisels a little bit dull, just whack it on a strop and bring up that Absolutely. edge. It's very easy to yeah. do. Well, you don't have to re-grind every time that you're... Um... So this is a good way of doing, removing waste when it's a, a complex angle. Yeah. Um, when you get to the other side, it's really important that you don't blow out that side, so yeah. I will flip it around. Yeah. But it's, a, it's a, a simple process. You'll notice that I am trying to set my chisel on the same angle as that cut so that I'm not cutting back into what's going to be the bottom of that mortise. Yeah. I think you could probably continue this process over the break. Over, yeah. over the break. Yeah, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. We've got a tiny tip where we show you how to mark out a bridle joint like this. 
Um, check it out. Make sure you come back after the break. And we're going to clean up these spaces and then we'll eventually get to gluing up our piece. So we'll see you very shortly. Hello there, welcome to this tiny workshop, Tiny Tip. My name is John Madden. Now, Patrick and I and Jeffrey have been building our thing and there's this little complicated, relatively complicated bridle joint to deal with. Now, generally speaking, this is not an overcomplicated joint, but because we don't have any tools in the workshop today that will cut a perfectly clean angled joint like so, how do we mark that out and get a really great finish to make this little stool for Jacko Jackson? The secret to getting a nice perfect result like this is not to try to cut that when you're actually making the joint. The secret is to trim it back once the joint is made. So what we will do is just slightly oversize that tendon and so when we assemble the, assemble the joint, glue it, we can trim that back using a hand plane. The first thing we're going to do is set that angle. Using our sliding bevel, we'll just pick up that joint, lay that down and tighten that up. So rather than starting out by drawing the line for the shoulder, we'll draw the line for the end of the joint, the end of the tenon. Now we transfer that line right around the end of our joint using our square. Now the next step is to mark the length of the tenon by using the width of the stock. All this material is 40 mil by 40 mil, so this is pretty simple. Just drop the timber on top of your marked out line and just mark the back. Then once again you can do is mark right around that joint. Now that we've marked this right around, we can just saw off using a Japanese saw. This little wedge that we don't need at the end. Try to make this cut really neat. You want to be about two or three millimetres from that line at the most. Now we have a nice flat surface on the end of our section of wood. We can mark around this to create the mortise and the tenon using our trusty marking gauge or mortising gauge in this sense. Be sure to mark the face side and only use the gauge on the one side. There you have it. Two sections of wood marked out for a bridal joint. Slightly oversized, we can plan it off later. See you back in the tiny workshop where Patrick and I will make this joint.
I'll start because I have one. Hey, everybody. Sorry, you caught us napping. Um, I have to clean up that mess that I've got on the inside there from where I chipped out those, those chips. The way I'm going to do that is by put that, putting that on the bench using a block that has that same angle on it, bringing that right to the line, clamping it down, and I can use that as a guide for my chisel. So I'm not up to um, doing the cheeks yet, which is what John's doing. Yeah, so I'm just paring off this cheek as you use the, the side here. Yeah. I've got that one pretty good. It's... Uh, What's this timber that we're using? That's just Taz Oak. Taz Oak. It's like 16 different species in one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's come up okay. Tearing, you're slicing across the grain you're, and you drop your last cut right in that line that you use when you mark. You saw in the video when we marked out the, uh, marked out the joint, the knife mark is where you do your last cut by placing the chisel in there. So yeah, don't start on that knife line. You'll be no. removing too much waste and, and your chisel will sway. So I'm going to place my smallest chisel against that guide and I'm going to tap it down into that cut. Now, I don't use the largest chisel because it'll have a tendency to deflect off the timber and change angle. So I'll do one pass with that really small one the, less, the least amount of material you can remove in one go, the more accurate your cut is going to be. Yeah. That's why you want to keep your, the weight either side of the line at a mill. Otherwise, you're here until tomorrow. Yeah. We're, time is money, Patrick. That's we right. need to get it done. So, I've also done this from the other side. So, I've cleaned up from both sides. That will probably do for right now. And I've got to move on to doing my cheeks as well. Mm. I'm just going to give this a quick pass on the strop. This does make a huge difference, especially after I whacked it with that hammer a number of times. Now, the way that I'm going to clean up my waste is actually by using a spacer as a guide. Now, the size of these, the side walls of this mortise are 12 mil. That's where my line is. This piece of stock is also 12 mil, so I'm going to use that to run my chisel on to give me a really um, neat cut. You can absolutely do it without this, but this is just a really nice way of doing it. For this work, I really like using these offset chisels. It allows you to place the chisel on a guide like this, and then you can just very neatly pair along that line and I'm going to take this pass by pass moving back into the mortise so that the full depth of the chisel is never fully engaged. I'm only really engaging a few mils of the corner and that's how you ensure that you, your chisel isn't deflecting off the timber and changing the angle. You're getting really nice consistent cuts. Okay. Now, I'll move that around, do that from the other side. How are you going? I'm good. I've got my two cheeks sorted out. So, I'm going to have a crack at the shoulders now. Now, the shoulder, cutting the shoulder, the little, I don't know, what, how do you cut shoulders? You, besides using a chisel, clearly, but. Um, well, I, I just do a tiny amount at a time. Yeah. And like, yeah, if you take off too much, it'll just, it just won't be, won't be flat. You want a sharp chisel. And so, I just drop it into that line. And I've kind of done this kind of thing before on Tiny Workshop. I'm just going to see if I can do this in one blow. Look, look, look down the chisel onto your marking out to get the alignment. Some people put a block and stuff. I guess I should do that, I don't know. You don't bash it hard, you just nice firm chopping and you hold the, your chisel like a fist. And then you've got really nice control, you yeah? know. A little bit of riding there. Seems to be a bit sharper. There you go. Yep, look, I'm, I know there are plenty of ways to do this. 
most certainly not everyone uses a guide like this and some people might consider it, I don't know, a bit lazy, but I think it gives you good results more rapidly and when I have to do a number of pieces, it gives you that kind of consistency that I think is harder to achieve just by hand so I can do them more quickly and get a better result through a whole number of pieces at, at one time. And that's kind of what I look for when I'm building production pieces because, you know, I've got to get the piece out the door mm-hmm. or I'm not going to get paid. Well, that's the, we were talking about that earlier, making a living as a woodworker. Woohoo! It's, um, I think in 2001 I made $4 in 12 months. But that's okay. It was fun. That's pretty good actually. <laughs> that's not an hour. <laughs> okay. And then at some point, we've got to see if these two fit, get, fit together. That'll be interesting. My chisels are built. One day, I'd like to show everybody how I do this most of the time in my workshop, which is with a panther router. <laughs> <laughs> which makes well, we might have a special event coming up for panther router, but we'll, we won't talk about that right now. Okay. How much longer will you get? I reckon I'm pretty close. I mean, I think that once we try and fit them, I'll have a rude shock, but... Um, I reckon it's going to be okay. I'm only having a huge amount of luck with my end grain, but that's okay. Generally, when you try and fit these together, if they're not fitting together really neatly, it's waste in the back corners, whether that's in the bottom of the mortise or on the side of the, of the shoulders. It's, it's inevitably, that's what's going to stop these two pieces coming together. So I definitely need to remove a bit more material. This is not the kind of process that you really want to be doing in a hurry. I think we've kind of we've expressed that before. It's stressful. Yeah. Because we're trying to knock out a joint and there's everything that can go wrong with it is gonna go wrong with it. Yeah. And it's all live, but that's okay. They're pretty desensitised these days. I don't think that's too bad. It's not my best work, but I think it's going to be fine. Just check how square that is. It's not bad. One thing I've learned about making joints by hand um, is to have a really close look at it. When you, because sometimes they don't land correctly, and you, it's hard to find where the little problem is. So if you stand there and stare at it for half an hour, so you'll probably work it out. But we don't have that kind of time in our hands, do we? I'm just testing this joint with another one here that I've cut that I I know is correct. Ultimately, I should be testing on the piece that John has because it's going to be the one that mates with this one. But since we're both working on it at the same time, the family shows. You should have the cricket on. All right, I'm done. Okay. Do you think that they will join together? Did I mark that one out? Was that one that you marked out? That's a good question. This is one that I marked out. So, if they don't, then we'll blame it on that. No, but see, what we've done, you've marked that out independently to mine. So, because we've two used two sets of tools, there's your error. Yeah. And all it is normally is, you know, Doesn't a, a billionth of a mill yeah. and it's gone. Anyway... Oh, you, you can do it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. Oh, no, that's good. It just needs a bit of a loose thing, yeah? Yeah. But, ultimately, that's in there. We got there. Put that in the vice. We've got a little block here. Oh, yeah. No, that's okay. It just needs a bit of... um. I haven't, I haven't done an exceptional job at cleaning out the bottom of my mortise, so we're never going to get an amazing joint straight off with this. But what I really want, what we wanted to demonstrate was that process of using the bandsaw to cut to the outside of the line and then moving over to the chisel to cut away that waste. No, but what's important is that the shoulders are fine yep. and they're uniform on both sides. There's a little bit of work here to be done. See that little line yep, there? That you still can still needs to see be Yeah, a little yeah. bit of the line is still showing. So for, if you remove that, and squeeze that with a clamp, mm. all good. That's not bad. Cool. Well, we did it. Sort of. 
Oh, now lie down. All right, so now what we're going to do is glue up the second part of Jacko Jackson's... What, we, we still haven't worked out what to call the thing. It's actually been a real problem, I think, because... Okay, so when we glue the thing up... So remember, people, that we currently have a competition going. We've had a few entrants and you've dropped off a bit, but I blame Jeff for that. Um, who can come up with the best name for this little... Stool, Montessori stool, the, the status, the cleaning your teeth, step ladder, I don't know. There's a $50 gift voucher in it. Send your entries to TimberCon, I don't know what it's called, the tiny workshop at timbercon.com.au. Also, I have a question that I asked the audience last week and I was very disappointed that no one gave me an answer, which is when you're putting a wedge in a piece of dowel, is it important that you look at the direction of the grain within the dowel, like where the growth rings are. In, well, yeah, and I said, I don't really know, but I bet someone has an answer. If someone, go look no up, one knows. Yeah, so come up, if, if there is a reason that you would do it one way or over another, Who let me know. Who came up with that question? Was um, that a, Jeff, Jeff asked me. Oh, Jeff, that's a typical Jeff yeah. question, though. Like, oh, oh now, you know, this... Okay, yeah. we won't make fun of Jeff. So these are the three pieces that need to be glued together. This is what it will eventually look like. The way that we're going to do this is we're first of all going to glue in the dowel into one unit, then we're going to attach the other unit into that dowel, then we're going to put the top in. Um, that is just the way that it has to be done. You will see the process that we use to clamp this together. We've made some spaces so that we can apply some clamping pressure. Because this is dowel and it doesn't have a shoulder, if you put a clamp on this, it would just keep sliding up the down. Yeah. So the spaces will, will keep us where we need to be. Is that the spaces there? Yeah, so we'll need the shorter ones, those three shorter ones. Okay. All right. Now, for those who are upset that we're not gluing the whole thing together in one go, too bad, because it's just it's a little bit too complex and we'll... Well, it takes it take forever and really, once you've seen me glue four of these down, you don't need to then see me do another six of them. No, so, no. Um, I would usually put some glue on a piece of wood like this, use it like a little pallet and then... Do you need anything to swoosh it around? In, getting into the holes, I use my fingers and oh, then okay. into the... Could um, I pre-glue something for you? You can. You can glue, you can put glue into those two holes there for me. Sure. Oh, I'm going to go with the attempt. Yep. Okay, look at this. This is like finger painting back in preschool. Do you remember preschool? No, at all. I do, a little bit. I, I remember I ripped the skin off my hand once. It was really painful. I remember one of those little tiny plastic trikes. Mm -hmm. They're like moulded plastic oh, trikes. Yeah. Um, and when you've got glue on your finger, before you clean it off, you put a little bit on the dowel. Now, once the glue goes on these... This all has to happen relatively quickly, but because these are wedged dowels, there is a bit of play in there. There's a little bit more room than you might find if you were um, doing another type of mortise and tenon. Okay. Now, it's important when we put these in that we get the wedge going in the correct direction, as I spoke about last time, and that we're putting the dowel in from the right direction in the member. I'm doing it this way because I'm right handed. Oh, of course. But yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to make sure that wedge is... Cool. Look at that. That looks pretty straight to me. Hands eyes. Oh, no, they're the other way, aren't they? Yeah, so. um, oops, I need to put some glue on that one. That is that direction. Um, that is straight. I've actually got some little lines drawn on the outside to help me with that alignment. Now, I'm going to put this on the table. It will get glue on the table. But oh, okay. with a little, little coat. Put a bit of glue on that one. Now we can put that on there. Okay, is it the right way? That is correct. Excellent. Now we can put a spacer in there. We can get rid of that for the time. Just actually, we'll leave it right there. I don't want to get glue on my, on my new flanny. I already cut it with a knife. I'm going to lay this on its side. We're going to use one of the quick grip clamps to apply some pressure. Pass me your pony. Bigger one, uh, bigger pony. Bigger one, sorry. Small pony. 
I too had a pony. Remember that Seinfeld episode? No. We all had ponies. Don't remember it. Oh, look, you're too young for Seinfeld, I suppose. Okay, that is applying some pressure on there. Now I want to put this into this situation. I'm going to flip this around so I have it in front of me. Just stand it up. No, because it'll just fall over. But you well, can I can hold it. I'm very obedient at times. Would you like to pellet some glue into that joint for me? Okay, we've got a little well, a flat bladed mixing doodah here. I'm going to use my fingers, my making fingers. sure you get it right onto the shoulders. Fingers are too fat to fit in there. Yeah, I don't think I'd get my fingers in that mortise either. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what we didn't do? When, when I didn't put wedges in those dowels. Oh, well, we can go back to we that. We need to just throw some in there. So many things going on and we're on live TV. Yeah, it's raining. How's the weather today? It's nasty. Yeah, still better than Queensland. 400 degrees. You know, in Queensland the weather's interesting because it's like either hot or it's less hot and there's not much else to it. And then it rains occasionally as well. Okay, so that's plenty of glue. Get yeah. that off my hands. We're going to slide that into the holes. Okay, now we will need a couple more of those clamps. One of the same size would be perfect. I'm going to put these on the same side so that I can lay this down. Just keep You're a messy bugger, aren't you? There's stuff everywhere. I know. And I need one more of the same size as well. Another one? We don't have any of that size. I think it could be a slightly smaller one, or actually, no, I don't. I don't want to space. Oh, it. you want to? Is that for the vertical group? Yeah. Okay. Let me consult the stable. Now we want to put one between here and here. Have you got a wedge for that? I do. Ooh, it's too short. One of the big boys. Now, it's possible that this wedge will slide, but I'm... Oh, shit, what am I doing? That's it, it's just there. Oh, sorry, we should move... Oh, no, it'll be fine, it's fine. Okay. Got pressure there. Now, if we can have Is a couple it? of you smaller clamps. Yep, I got it. Pull that one there, just on it. Excellent, we can put them on... Just on the top here. Oh, do you want to use a G-clamp for that? Yeah, sure. Just hold that unit. Oh. Should we bring this down? Yeah, and then we can work on a flat surface. Okay. Oh, here, you put that one on. Now, if I was doing this myself, in my workshop, there's no way I would then go and glue this into the next piece while this was still wet. I would just let it dry. I'm so glad we decided not to do that. Yeah, there's just too much going on. Now, yeah. what we have to do now is put some of those wedges in. So, I've got some wedges here. We're going to dip each of them in glue. Really, I should have done this before I... It okay? doesn't need to be because no, this is what we're doing. I should have done this before we clamped it up. I don't like the idea of hitting this thing that's in clamps with a mallet, but just tap it, don't hit it. <laughs> Lovely, there's one. Now these little wedges I cut last week on the bandsaw and you can go back and watch that if you need a demonstration. Okay, I'm going to come around to the other side and put some wedges in. Squeeze past. I'm just wiping off the glue because there's one thing about glue that's really annoying. If you leave it on there, it stays on there and it dries. And it's not such a big deal because you can pair some of it off and whatever but it'll affect your finish. And especially on those internal corners. It's uh, impossible to sand off. And you can't sand it off. You've got to get it off while it's still wet. If you don't get it off, you'll be sorry, trust me. The really nice thing about doing these wedges is you get a whole bunch of 
that glue squeezing out of those holes, which means it's, it's making a really nice, strong joint. Um, now, where's my other dowel? One more here. I think all in all we did okay. Well, no one died. That's always good. So Nick looks distressed. How are you going, man? We may have had a few transmission problems tonight, so if you missed any of the program, we do stream this by tomorrow morning normally, so you can go online, Tim McCon's um, YouTube channel, and watch the program again. Um, mind you, if you've already watched it, why would you go back for more? But hey, just telling you if we had any problems. Well, I think uh, we've... Uh, essentially demonstrated most of the things on how to build this. Now, next week, we are going to be talking about the seat, how that joins in with this. Yeah. I'll come back with these dowels glued in as well, because like I said, you don't need to see me glue in another, another three dowels. Um, we'll talk about the seat, we'll talk about some finishing, uh, some scraping, and also some options for either painting or oiling this device, and, and some different mm. products that we use for that. That's something that we haven't discussed much, and uh, what sort of finish will we apply to this piece? Now, we should really ask Jacko Jackson. Why? We're doing this for free. Anyway, um, good question. Maybe, Jacko, if you've got any thoughts on the finish, I'm thinking something a bit different because it's quite a plain timber and the world needs another clear-coated Tasmanian oak thing of some kind. So, But maybe we could do something different. Yep. I've been thinking, why don't we have a crack at using milk paint? I've never really spent much time with that. No, nor have I. So it could be dangerous, but we could do it in a nice colour. Now, both the grandchildren are girls. I don't want to sound all sort of, you know, we can't do a pink. That would be dumb because then we get in trouble for that. So, Jacko, if you've got any thoughts on colours or finishes, well, send me an email. If we paint it, we're not going to see my lovely red gum wedges in the end. Oh, we can scratch it off in that part. <laughs> The nice thing about um, milk paint is that it's a very low toxicity finish. Um, it's easy to do. It's nice and colourful and bright. Alternatively, we'll just go with some, maybe something like from the Libos range. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect for kids' stuff. That bench top oil, which is designed for wet areas. I think that might be the go as well. So, mm. let's stand this up and have a look at it. Yeah? Ta -da! All right, glue. Very important. Get all your glue off or you'll... By the time you try to sand it out, you'll just ruin the form and it's just not cool. And if you think, oh, I can't see anything, and you put a clear over it, ping, you'll and it reappears, it. and then you'll definitely see it. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Patrick, let's lay that down because we want to see your big blue eyes, mate. So I think we're done tonight. We've run out of time. Come back next week. We'll have this assembled. Yep. We're going to cut all these joints off and sand it up and make it beautiful. And the aim is next week to, yeah, put a finish on and get it finished. Then, and then we can send it out to uh, Jacko and everyone will be happy. Um, if you've got a good idea for the name of this piece, please send it in. We're desperate to give away one or two, maybe three gift vouchers. And tell me if it matters which direction the wedges yeah. enter the tenon. I, I know that it matters which direction so they're not going to split the over the, the mortise. I don't think it matters because it's like a... How yeah, can it split it? Because it's, in, it's encased. There's, timber expands a different amount along its growth rings as opposed to... Yeah, I understand this, but like even yeah. still... Anyway, if anyone's got an idea... It's a chairmaker's question. Uh, yeah. Chairmaker. Any chairmakers out there? Hopefully. All right, thank you very much, Patrick. No worries. Thanks, John. Um, see you next week when we're going to wrap this piece up. And it's actually the last episode for the season next week, so... We will do a third season in a short time, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, send us your thoughts. Thanks very much for watching, and uh, we'll see you next week.